Welcome to my Cisco Scaling Networks lecture review. Here we're doing the third installment of the CCMA, which is the Scaling Network material. Here we're doing Chapter 6, Multi-Area OSPF. We just finished Chapter 5, which was adjusted and troubleshooting single-area OSPF. So now let's start getting into the complications of multi-area. I want to talk about what multi-area is and how to configure it. Our goal here is to explain why we use it, how we use it, how we establish uh, neighbor, uh, neighbor adjacencies, look at version 2 and version 3 OSPF, and verify. So let's go ahead and get jumped right into multi-area. So single area OSPF is useful in a smaller network. If it becomes too big, we start getting more and more issues. Uh, based off of the amount of routers we have. One of the issues with OSPF is large routing tables doesn't summarize by default and that does mean larger link state databases which makes things slower and that means frequent spanning tree uh, protocol algorithms calculations because again the multi area the single area of a large network makes it run a little bit slower. So what we can come up with is this multi-area. Everything connects back to area zero, but we have different spheres of control. You can have different areas of the network controlled by different areas or different groups. That actually helps alleviate all of that. We have area zero as our backbone area, and then the other areas of our network connect back to our backbone. So OSPF is a two-layer hierarchy. We have our regular backbone, our transit area, and we have our regular non-backbone area. Basically, the backbone area is where primary function is fast, efficient movement. Uh, it inter interconnects other OSPF types. We call this area zero. All the regular ones connect back to our backbone, and they connect users and resources. And typically, regular uh, area does not allow traffic from one area to another area. But I mean, again, that's going to be subjective. Types of OSPF routers. Here we have just an internal router. Here we have backbone routers. But we also have what's called an area gateway or an area border router, typically called AB, uh, ABRs. You sometimes see them referred to as gateways, but not always. These guys right here, they're in the middle. They're in both areas. So they're area borders. Here we could have an autonom aut autonomous system boundary. So this may be your company. And here we have one major sphere of control one autonomous system. When we leave to go to the internet, that's a different area. What are the different types of LSAs? We keep talking about LSAs, but what are they? First, keep in mind, typically this is CCMP level material. When I did my CCMP, this is all CCMP. They recently did a restructure of their exam so this is CCNA now, but I think we'll probably put it back at CCMP, but we'll see. So type 1 LSA is a router LSA. Type 2 is a network LSA. Type 3 and 4 is summary. Type 5 is a AS external LSA. And for our course, those are going to be the most common. Other types that are not common at this level, but still happen. Multicast OSPF, a defined NSSA network, an external attribute LSA for BGP, that's type 8, and types 9, 10, and 11 are the OPEC LSAs. Again, we're most concerned with 1 through 5, but at least that way we kind of have a general idea of what the other ones are. All of this, advanced route, or CCMP route. <laughs> so let's go ahead and let's look in depth, type 1. 
This is going to be between routers. Type one LSAs include a list of directories, connected network prefixes, and link types. All routers generate type 1. All type 1 LSAs are link state ID is identified by the router ID of the originating router. Type 2 identifies the routers on the network and the addresses for the multicast links. Only a DR generates type 2 designated router. Type 2 LSAs are flooded within the multi-access network and do not go beyond a area bridge router. Type 3 is going to be one that goes between our areas. Type 3 describes the network addresses learned by type 1. Type 3 is required for every subnet. The area bridge routers flood type 3 LSAs to other areas and are regenerated by other area uh, border routers. Type 3 link state ID is identified by the network address, not by the originating router ID, but here uh, type 3 identified the network address. By default, routes are not summarized. Type 4 is going to be from the area system bridge or the autonomous system bridge router it's going to propagate to other networks they're used to advertise the ASBR to others the ABRs generate type 4 type 4 is generated by the original ABR and regenerate by other ABRs link state ID is identified by the router ID of the autonomous system border router this guy right here is going to be the one connecting our autonomous system number to the internet or to another network. Thus, this is our ASBR. And he's going to be propagating typically our type 4. Type 5 are used to advertise external network addresses. And ASBR generates type 5 LSA. Type 5 are fly throughout the network and is regenerated by all the appropriate area bridge routers. Type 5 link state ID is the external network address, not summarized by default. So there's our key 5. So let's go ahead and look at the routing table and understand what the O's mean. Because here we have OSPF. Here we have E1 which is also OSPF. Here we have N1, N2, E2. So what does that mean? O, router type 1, and network type 2 LSAs describe the details within an area, an intra-area, internal to your area. O, IA, that guy right there, is a inner area. So it summarizes the LSAs appeared in the routing table as an inner area route. O, E1, and O, E2 are external types. Type 1, E1, or external type, type 2. That's going to be the external types right there. That way when we see these, is it O, is it OIA, is it OE, is it OE? Two, we have a little bit more of an understanding. So we, here we have another example. But this is for IPv6. Again, O, O, I, A, O, E1, O, E2. Same thing for IPv6. Intra area routes, external type 1, external type 2, router type 1, network type 2. Pretty much the same for IPv6. So let's go ahead and get into our OSPF route calculation. So all the routers calculate the best path to the destination within their area, that, that inner area. They have these entries at the routing table. So you may end up with duplicate paths to different areas. So all routers will then calculate the best path to other areas within the inner network 
the inter area, or a type 3 and type 4 LSAs, all routers calculate the best path to the external autonomous system number, type 5 destinations. These are noted within OE1 and OE2 type routes. So the ones that are left in the routing table will be the best paths that are depicted by the designated router, or the, the DR. So if there's multiple pathways, the best path or the best uh, avenue will be left in the router. We may have backup routes, but the backup routes are not shown in the show IP route table or in the route table. So how do we configure this? That's always a big one. We've talked about some of the concepts. How do we put it into practice? So we have to have an implementation plan. Normally we look at our parameters, we define OSPF, we configure OSPF, and we verify it. Pretty straightforward. So here we have a three area OSPF, area one connected to area zero, area two connected back to area zero. So on R1, we're going to have a, our bridge portion because it is a area bridge. And you'll notice that we have our router OSPF, just like we normally would, but our network statements are going to include areas from both area 1 and area 0. This is all underneath the same router process ID. If we're dealing with OSPF version 3, same thing. We're including the appropriate area. As long as you include the area zero link, you can have things in other areas. There has to be a path back to area zero because everything connects to area zero. How do we do route summarization? So here if we're looking at R1, R1 is going to be our bridge router, our area bridge router, sorry. R1 will forward a summary LSA to the core router, C1, in uh, terms of a type 3 LSA. C1 will distribute that summarized LSA type 3 to all other routers. Inter area and external route summarization. Again, all of this will be sent summaries routes to one LSA. And that's all area bridge routers will forward that to our core router or our autonomous system bridge router. All of this occurs on our area bridge router and applies to routes from within each of our areas to our area zero. So again that summarization will be specific to the external routes that are injected into OSPF via some type of redistribution because we can take routes and we can distribute them or redistribute them into a different routing protocol. That's called route redistribution. The autonomous system bridge router will summarize external routes and inject what it needs to. Inter-area summarization. We will have a bridge router summarize it to our core router or our bridge router just so that it has it and will process as needed. We can always verify by again looking at the show IP route OSPF and looking at that output. We've already talked about route summarization. That's going to be what's common in our addresses. What's common in our subnets. How do we configure the inner area route summarization? We can actually have what's called an area range and that will be route summarization. But you'll notice here we're not using wildcard, we're using a summarized subnet. So area 1 range, the appropriate summarized IP with the appropriate summarized subnet mask. So how do we verify multi-area OSPF? Pretty much with our same show commands. Show uh, OS IP OSPF neighbor, OSPF, OSPF interface brief, 
protocols, um, uh, IP route OSPF or OSPF database, things like that. Remember, for IPv version 6, you would do IPv6 instead of just IP. Here we have a show IP protocols. This is going to be done for just IPv4. If we're looking at the interface brief, we can see our multi-area. You'll see that everything under one uh, process ID. And we can see that we have designated routers. Here's an example of the OSPF routes. Here's an example of our database. You're going to see again the link IDs, the advertised routers, the age, the sequence, a checksum if need be. Here is again another verification for multi area OSPF version 3. You're doing show IPv6 OSPF interface brief instead of just show IP. So again, this is going to be for version 3 for IPv6. When you do your show IPv6 protocols, this is what we're looking at. The areas and the interfaces in each area. If you do a IPv6 route, again, we're looking for OSPF I. OSPF I should be the, where did it go? And that's all ISIS, ISIS Tech 2, OSPF, OSPF Enter. O is just Intra, OI is Enter, OE1, OE2, so forth. If we do a show IPv6 OSPF database, again, this is what it's going to look like. Our advertising router, the age, our links, our bits. If we're dealing with uh, prefixes, they're going to be listed as well. Or interfaces. And that's actually this chapter in a nutshell. Make sure that you understand kind of why we use multi-area OSPF. Understand the calculations. You understand the different types of LSA types, one through five at least. You understand how to do a basic configuration for OSPF. You go through the appropriate show commands. There's lots of them, I understand, but this is one that the more that you do, the more that you retain. You just get used to doing the appropriate show commands. And that's this chapter in a nutshell. I want to thank you.